the boy and the bear in a boat. Previously, the boy and the bear had been following a blue bird and got lost in the mist. At the end of the story, they had bumped into something. Let's find out what they bumped into. Chapter 20, Mermaid. The boy awoke. For a moment, he couldn't remember where he was. Then he remembered that he was in the boat, but couldn't remember having gone to sleep. But he was lying down in his usual spot between the rear and the centre seats and he had just woken up, so he must have gone to sleep. But he couldn't remember and there was something else wrong. Ow, he said again and that reminded him. How's your head? asked the bear, standing over him with a cup of tea, as the boy delicately raised himself up from the deck. It feels like it's full of bees, said the boy. You should be more careful, said the bear. You went flying into my belly and then bashed your head on the deck after you'd, er, uh, bounced off. You could do yourself a serious mischief jumping about like that. I wasn't jumping about. I fell off, said the boy. You should be more careful and look where you're going. I couldn't look where I was going, could I? We couldn't see anything, said the bear, because of the mist, remember? Well, that's no excuse for bumping into the boy looked at the bear. We bumped into something, said the boy. Yeah, said the bear. What did we bump into, said the boy. See for yourself, said the bear, waving a paw over his shoulder. The boy looked up past the bear and through the thinning Mr. A dark looming shape close behind him. It's a ship, said the boy. Yeah, it is, said the bear, sipping from his cup. Well, are we going aboard then, said the boy. What are we waiting for? And that's the ship that they could see. The bear lifted up his cup. I'm just finishing my tea, he said. He took another sip and I've shouted ahoy and nobody's answered. The crew are either very rude or... Or what, said the boy? Or deaf? No, said the bear. Or very, very shy, said the boy. No, said the bear. I don't think that he's on board. Well then, said the boy, and he pushed past the bear, picking his way past the gas stove and teapot on the floor, leaned over the side and reached out a hand towards the ship. Look, there's a rope. Here we can climb up. At least no one alive, said the bear. I think it might be. What, said the boy. A ghost ship, said the bear. That's ridiculous, said the boy. But it came out sounding strange because he shivered as he said it. He looked up at the ship. It did look creepy. And it was very old. Old enough to be in a museum rather than out at sea. Its sails were tattered and its rigging looked like spider's webs. Faded, flaking, painted lettering spelled out the ship's name. The Mermaid. On its prow, beside a carved wooden mermaid figurehead, her face worn, almost featureless by many years of sea and weather. But more than how it looked, there was something the boy felt something 
deep inside his otherwise empty stomach. Something wrong. The boy's hands wavered in the air, just short of the dangling rope. The gentle rise and fall of the waves, rocking the Harriet, tipped the boy's arms, sometimes towards and sometimes away from the ship. A slight breeze pushed the rope and set it in motion, its free end swinging in a slow circle. Hand and rope moved back and forth and round and round, dancing a strange dance together without ever quite touching. The boy watched them, mesmerised, forgetting altogether that the hand was his own and that he could pull it away at any time and stick it safely in his pocket. He was fascinated and petrified, wondering what would happen if his hands were to touch the rope. Maybe if anything living touched anything ghostly, then it died. Could that be right? Cock, said the bird, and there's the bird on the rope. The boy and the bear looked up and saw a bright blue shape perched in the rigging of the man main mast looking very much alive. The rope brushed against the back of the boy's hand. Nothing bad happened. The boy grabbed the rope, pulled it towards him, took hold with the other hand too and stepped onto the side of the Harriet. I suppose you'd thought you'd scared me, he said to the boy bear but I'm climbing on board. With that, he lifted his feet and swung the short distance to the ship. His feet hit the side with a reassuring, unghostly thud, and he began to climb the rope. Only he couldn't. The boy had seen loads of films where heroes climbed up ropes and it always looked really easy but he never actually done it himself. It turned out it wasn't easy at all, especially when sea spray had made both the rope and the side of the ship wet and slippery. His feet slid down and it was all the boy could do not to fall off entirely. He dangled there for a while, feeling equally scared and silly his feet just above the water. Take your time, said the little bit, said the bear eventually. No rush. Oh, shut up and help me out here, said the boy. Rato, said the bear. He swallowed the last of his tea and put the empty cup down. Then he took hold of the boy and lifted him effortlessly back into the little boat. The boy grabbed the rope again. You could climb this, couldn't you? You'll have a good grip if you dig your claws in. Maybe, said the bear, but I'm not happy going aboard uninvited. It's rude to go aboard and a captain's vessel uninvited. But if you think there's nobody on board, then how can you be invited? In fact, if there's nobody on board, then maybe as a fellow captain, you could go aboard just to make sure the ship is all right, as a favour. The bear glanced up at the ship and then back at the boy. He looked like he was thinking. Then he looked resigned and then he looked determined. You're right. I am said the boy. Ye, yeah, we'll have to go aboard. You can climb onto my back and I'll carry you up. Eh, tie us to the ship. I need to grab a few things. The bear handed the boy the end of the short coil of a tatty rope and began to stuff, stuff some things into his suitcase. He was busy and efficient now that the decision was made. 
The boy looked up again and as he tied the bear's rope to the ship's rope, the mist had risen enough for him to have a clear view of the ship now. But a few foggy tendrils remained, clutching at the upper parts of the mass like the fingers of a giant ghost. He finished off a messy knot, joining the two ropes, quickly attached the free end to the Harriet and gulped down his fear. Come on, said the bear. He was right in front of the boy with a suitcase in one paw. He turned around and crouched a little. The boy climbed onto the seat and from there jumped up onto the bear's back, wrapping his arms around his neck. Hold on tight, said the bear. And the boy did as he was told. The bear put the handle of the suitcase between his teeth, leaped nimbly from the side of the boat, neatly caught hold of the rope, and climbed straight up as it, climbed straight up it as effortlessly as walking along the pavement. The boy clung to the neck, dangling and swaying as the bear raced upwards. There they are climbing the boat. Then all at once they were all over the rail, the bear landing elegantly on his feet, the boy losing his grip and sprawling on the deck. He got up, took a deep sigh, calming breath as he looked around. And we'll find out tomorrow what they discover on board the boat. <laughs> <laughs>